it's, it's really lovely to be here. Uh, it's great to look out and see such an outstanding array of surprisingly useful. You, know, you, look, um, you look energetic, which is um, not always the truth for statisticians. We sometimes find ourselves a bit ground down. I say again and again, I really, really mean that the kind of work you're doing is the most important work there is for policy. Uh, again, we don't always feel that. Although looking out at, at, at this group, you look to me a relatively self-confident group. Too often, statisticians aren't as confident as they ought to be in the importance of what they're doing. I, I like playing a thought experiment of what would happen uh, in Whitehall and Westminster, in the media village, if we were to turn off the power at places like Nisra, turn off the power at Newport, turn off the power at Ditchfield. Well, very soon, the newspapers, the radio and television wouldn't have anything to write or speak about. The Monetary Policy Committee wouldn't be able to work out how to set interest rates. The Department of Health wouldn't know how to allocate resources to the different regions of the nations. Uh, local authority funding would become impossible. We wouldn't know what the problems that policy should be tackling were. The work that you're doing, the work that we stand for, is the absolute prerequisite to trying to run any kind of country, whether it's the economy or the society that we're thinking about. That's important. We need, to, we need to remember that we are actually the most important people in the world, and not just our families. Um, we do underestimate it. But you know, just look at the newspapers. You know, the newspapers are full of references to your work. A day doesn't go by without statistics actually being at the very top of everybody's agenda. That is the medium of debate, even if it's not well understood. And most of what I want to say today is about understanding. So if there's a single way in which I think throughout its career, the statistics authority, throughout her career, Jill, throughout my career, I have been wanting to move us on as a community. It's making sure that the fabulous and vital work that we do has all of the impact that it needs to. And if we do that, we need to take the way in which we communicate it incredibly seriously. If we communicate it well, then it can do marvellous things. If we communicate it badly, then sometimes it can reinforce people's prejudices and stereotypes. And we need to remember that people don't feel comfortable with statistics. Even if they're actually perfectly capable of understanding, they don't feel comfortable. For most people, this is something that makes them feel anxious and insecure. And our job is to draw the richness out of the marvellous data that we're collecting and present it to people in a way that makes it come alive. Now, Norm has already very kindly mentioned why it was that I didn't get here until rather late last night, which is that we finally got to the a point of decision on the funding of social care in England. Um, now, the system in Northern Ireland is somewhat different, although I suspect this is an area that the Northern Irish government is going to need to come back to. And, and when we were working on that funding of transport in England, I came home and asked trip out here to talk with colleagues in, in Northern Ireland about how it's done here. Many of the fundamental issues look rather the same. And, and the fundamental, the most fundamental issue is shown on this chart. Um, so here's an example of the kind of data that gets a lot of coverage and um, the kind of data that's always wrong actually, it's forecast data, so these, these numbers are definitely wrong. Um, one of the funniest charts I've got, which I haven't got here today, is a chart that shows forecast population over the age of 65 at various points over the last 40 years, and the forecast changed quite a lot because actually we're getting to live longer and longer. Um, but you know, the basic story of a chart like this kind of thing that, that is used again and again is clear that the number of old people is going to grow. So we expect the number of people aged 85 and over to double over the next 20 years. And I, I haven't looked at the numbers specifically for Northern Ireland, but my guess is they'd be very, very similar here. This, I think, is a good example of how sometimes people can get the interpretation wrong. So this is often referred to as the burden of ageing. Um, this can be this terrible burden of people living on it. Well, it's a very strange way of describing it, because I, I really hope that in 2030 I'm going to be in the second bar from the left. I'd much rather be in the second bar from the left in 2030 than not. Uh, something I point out again and again over the last 
two and a half years is that the alternative to the burden of ageing is the burden of being stiff, which by and large you know, we, you know, we would not prefer. So this example of how you know, even relatively straightforward statistics of what's going to happen to the number of older people require us to put some context on it, require us to, to make some interpretation of it. Without any interpretation, it doesn't really go anywhere. Now I'm going to try and do something sophisticated, which is go back one slide. And, and Jill and I will give me instructions. And the, the reason I'm on first is so I can make the mistakes. Um, ah, perfect. Um, this is one of my favourite slides at the moment. It shows that in 1901 in, in uh, the UK there were 61,000 people aged 85 and over. And now there are 1.447 million. People age 65 and over. So the number of people age, age, sorry, age 85 and over has increased by a multiple of 25. Now, if the people who think ageing is a huge problem are right, then presumably that degree of ageing would have caused quite a lot of problems. It's true that looking forward we've got some ageing, but looking backwards we've accommodated massively more ageing than we've seen today. We've not been overrun as far as I know. Maybe this is, maybe in Belfast there has been a problem of marauding gangs of Monty Python S. Hell's grants, and maybe that's been a big issue for you here over the last hundred years, but I rather doubt it. So one of the points I often want to make about statistics is let's not just look forwards. Because looking forwards, there's quite likely to be change. We're not in a world of just stasis. So there will be change, but look backwards to remind yourself of how much change has been accommodated and often it's been massive. And in Northern Ireland, change in all kinds of dimensions. It's been massive, and actually in many ways rather positive, so it's always important to remember this. Something that I think we'll end up doing more of over the next few years is bringing together data from both public sector and private sector, data from surveys, data from administrative data, into single forms. And I think one of, the, one of the things that's exciting for us all as a profession is thinking about that. This is, this is my favourite chart for the last two and a half years. I, um, this, this is almost the last chart I'm going to show you that's about care of the elderly, but I, it, it is my favourite chart, so I can't resist it. The challenge in, in analysing what we're doing in care of the elderly was trying to work out what the real problem was. And my sense was that the way of demonstrating the problem was to show people what the probability distribution of care costs was. So this is a chart where imagine that you guys you take, you take 165 year olds and you line them up in order of how much care costs they're going to have before they die. So the people at the left, the 23% 20, of 65 year olds will die before they have any care needs. That could be because they die on the day after their 65th birthday, or it could be they live till they're 100 and then have a heart attack. Anymore. But most of us are going to need care. Uh, the median care need before death will be 20,000. But the really important thing about this is what happens at the end. That the, that this is a high speed distribution, some people face enormous care costs. Uh, we showed there peaking at 300,000, but actually it could be half a million or more. Where do you get that data from? And that's not at all straightforward, because of course, really rather little care in England is provided by the state, quite a lot of it is funded by the state, most of it is provided by the private sector, but quite a lot of what's Provided he's not even paid for by the state, he's paid for by private individuals. So getting uh, a full distribution across the whole of this population meant that we had to put together data from a private sector provider, UPA, and local authority data. If you look carefully, you can see there are a few little blips in the distribution, which suggests we didn't get our smoothing algorithms absolutely right. But despite that, putting this data together from multiple sources gave us a picture that demonstrated that the real problem with social care from the individual's perspective, is the fear that comes with there being an, an unproved risk that unlike any other part of their lives, this is an area where people face a relatively small chance of a catastrophic risk and nothing they can do about it. I don't want to talk about the policy now, but that data became the most important part of seeing the way through and was an astonishingly important part of communicating that. Now, same with communication, the most important thing about a number is how big it is. I'm pretty sure. That really is the most important thing in a number. And finding good ways of representing big numbers is hard. Um, it's not been worked out by some neuropsychologists showing that uh, Italian people 20 years ago with dementia were much better at sums with big numbers than English people with dementia. 
And why was that? Well, it was because of the lira. They were used to doing sums with thousands in it. Most of us are not used to doing sums with big numbers. For most people, once a number is bigger than their mortgage or the value of their house, it stops having really significant meaning. And one of the things that, that we have to do is find ways of presenting our data that is meaningful. Uh, something I've spent lots of time in the last 35 years doing is talking about public policy and trying to get people to understand the relative size of the cost of different things. And, and this is a new way of, of doing it that we thought of when we were doing the social care work. So this is a representation of UK public spending. There are 697 little grey boxes because in the relevant year there were 697 billion pounds of public spending. And what we were trying to do here is give people a sense of the relative magnitudes. <coughs> So, we've got the NHS 103 billion, Social Security for all people 85, Education 61, Defence 44, Social Care and Disability Benefits uh, 27 billion. The cost of the reforms that I was proposing two and a half years ago, 2 billion. So, the point of this was to represent how small those costs were. Um, but you'll see, sort of, just above the top left centre, there, there's an almost invisible dot which is NISRA. NISRA's net budget 9.1 million. Um, that's how tiny as a share of total national, spe national spending and public spending are. The MNS, much bigger, but still only 0.15 billion, a tiny part of one of the 700 blocks of a billion that makes up the overall level of spending. And so for the MNS or for NISRA, the story that you need to tell yourselves is that if any of the work that you do, or the ONS does, or the wider GSS does, has even a very small positive impact on the policies that are determining the allocation of that massive 700 billion pounds, then the rate of return to this nation on that spending is huge, absolutely massive. What we do is extraordinarily cheap and potentially astonishingly powerful. Because what we do is informing the whole of that £700 billion, pounds, the way in which it's done. And we're doing that with very, very small amounts of money. So don't ever be embarrassed about the resource that we're spending on analytical work. It is a vital prerequisite to getting things right. Now, so let's talk a bit more about communication, um, which, which is my particular obsession. I'm going to... Uh, I'm going to try and pick up all my colleagues again. Try and pick up. Let's put up all seven because I'm not controlling this as a separate seminar. <clears throat> so there's lots of advice that comes out to you about communication. There's quite a lot of quite detailed advice. What we try to do here is, is think about seven important things to bear in mind when we're communicating. And some of these are things that I think we easily forget. I'll go through them quickly, then I'll pass a few slides that illustrate some of them a little bit more. The first is uncertainty. So I think one of the most important things for us to do when we're talking about, about our data, about our statistics, is to help people remember that they're wrong. Every single number that we produce is wrong, but it's the best, it's the least wrong, the best indicator of anything that we've got. And the reason I think it's important to talk about uncertainty is so that, for example, when our estimates change, people don't see we've done, we've made some awful mistake. We haven't made a mistake, we've got a bit more information, so we've got a slightly better estimate. Uh, again and again, at the, at the national level, for example, when the GDP estimates change, there's a sense that somehow the ONS made a mistake. We didn't make a mistake. It produced an early estimate, all we've ever got are estimates. And, and being clear that what we've got are estimates I think it's really helpful. It also helps to avoid over-interpretation of short-term fluctuations. We know that our data is noisy. We know that there's a tendency in the media in particular, but also amongst politicians, to want to know what the latest bit of information is, and they're massively over-interpreted. So just always remember that there is uncertainty in that. A second thing to emphasise is the importance of trends. Let's go back to my point about not being processed just with the latest bit of data. I think that is a trap that we can fall into because it's also what we most recently produced. But often what's really powerful about our data is the story it tells us over quite a long 
time and becoming obsessed with a point estimate of the first differential in the level of something is easy to do because that's where most of our work goes on, but often that doesn't tell us the whole story. So think about things. Think about, think very, very hard about accessibility. And that can mean expressing numbers in ways that people understand. So in the case of public spending, for example, statements of the form, I know that public spending on education in North Ireland is this many billion pounds, really doesn't cut it for people. Because it just doesn't mean anything. Think about expressing education as an amount per child or an amount per family. Then you've got a chance that you're, you're describing your numbers in a way that actually allows people to compare them to something that is meaningful for them. International comparisons, as well as compar uh, and this just doesn't mean comparisons between the UK and Germany, it can also mean comparisons between what's happening in Northern Ireland, what's happening in Stop what's happening in England, what's happening in Wales. There's real richness and potential for real understanding, real increase in wisdom by comparing quite similar things across slightly different uh, structures of policy. So, comparisons between what's happening in healthcare in, and, and social direction between Northern Ireland, Wales, Scotland, and England, those sorts of things are potentially very, very helpful. And it's really worth doing. Thinking about context, I said earlier that I think the most important thing about a number is how big it is. I do think that's true, but that, that size is a part of the context within which the number is sitting. So thinking about the wider context is very important. I have a particular bit more about attribution and causation. Almost always all that we can say is that something is associated with something else. It's very rarely the case that we can really say what a cause was. And if we slip into that language, then we slip into the kind of imprecision in thinking, which is what I think statistics is all about avoiding, and finally do please use plain English. Um, we no longer have a sentence in early on in the GDP first estimate press release that says the change volume index of GDA. We now say, <coughs> I think uh, GDP is estimated to have grown or shrunk by X in and in. The difference between those two statements of people who are not one of us is actually very dramatic. Let me quickly try to illustrate some of these points. <clears throat> Here's an example. The next slide is an example of, I think, the importance of trends. So this is a slide that shows what's happened to GDP over the last just over 60 years. And the reason I think this is important is that real GDP has actually gone up by a multiple of five since 1948. We are five times as well off as we were 60 years ago, on average. And same is true of household real incomes. That story is simply not understood. Um, actually, I should, have, I should have done this. Yeah, I, should have played, I should have played a game with you. I almost always do. I always, almost always, when I talk about statistics, make people do a multiple choice question at the beginning. <clears throat> and statisticians are no better than anybody else. I played this game, and this is one of the things I've done. I say, what, you know, what's happened to the real level of GDP since 1948? I've never had a group get anywhere close to the right answer, uh, including all of the permanent secretaries, um, who, and this was before Jill was a permanent secretary. Sure, Jill, uh, Jill both got the numbers right and also acted differently. When I did it with the permanent secretaries about 10 years ago, they, they're the only group that's ever refused to answer by raising their hands. <laughs> they insisted, they insisted on answering anonymously on pieces of paper. And raising the answers, it was a jolly good thing that they did. Say. Um, but you know, they, they underestimated by at least half the extent to which GDP. Grove Bishops did the same. The economists at the Treasury did the same. Uh, it's really important to know what's been going on the plane. It's really important also, for example, to know that, which you can see from this chart, that the period, the period up to 2008 was astonishing because it was the longest period in modern history that we've ever gone without a recession. It's actually, maybe we shouldn't have been that surprised that a recession came along in 2008 after all pride comes before a fall. Um, but then you can also see that what's happened since 2000, in 2008 there's a really big collapse They've become again, and since then it's basically been flat. So this kind of trend is at least as important as what's going on with the month by month, quarter by quarter number. 
Then there are some numbers that we really just should know. So this next slide used to be, for, for about 20 years, this was my favourite slide, and in a fickle way, I'm now, I've moved to the social care slide. This slide is just the, the weekly household income distribution in the UK. So you need to multiply those numbers on the bottom by 52 to get the right incomes. The, the, the different colours are decile, so the bottom decile finishes at about £200 a week. The median income in, in, in the UK in 2010-11 was about £20,000 a year. The top 10% uh, of the income distribution started if it was a bit more than £40,000 a year. When you ask people the multiple choice question, what, you know, what income do you need as a child that's happened to be in the top 10% of the UK income distribution and gives them 40, 60, 80, 100, or 125, in most audiences, most people say 100 or 125. And the answer is 40. And probably the answer in Northern Ireland for the median income because Northern Irish families is a little bit lower than that. We have a complete misapprehension about what the country in which we live is really like. It's simultaneously true that we're better off than we were 60 years ago by massively more than we imagine. And that the middle of the household income distribution is massively lower <coughs> than most people think. We have a political debate where people talk about middle income households by which they imagine a GP married to a school teacher. A GP married to a school teacher is in the high bar at the far end, which is and everything else beyond that, massively beyond the middle of the income distribution. And, and so we need, when we're helping in the framing of policy, to remind the whole world again and again of what the world actually is like. <clears throat> we rely too much on averages. So we've often called this recession the worst recession since the 1930s. Well, it's true that GDP has fallen by more than in any recession since the 1930s. But this is the claimant count. You see the claimant count unemployment has increased by massively less than in the last two recessions. <laughs> That's because recessions are complicated things. Most things that we look at with statistics are complicated. And trying to summarise them in a single, single statistic will often be misleading. Characteristic of this recession, unlike the last, is it began by hitting some really very highly paid people, which means you get a much bigger fall in GDP much more quickly than in the last two recessions. And we also seem to have had a much more flexible labour market. No, no, no. Some of Jill's colleagues at the ONS have done very interesting work on this puzzle that employment is continuing to rise while GDP is falling. I'm not sure how much of a puzzle it turns out to be. I think their work has demonstrated that. Real earnings have been falling. So earnings have been going up by less than inflation. So employment can grow in those contexts without GDP rising because the real return to being a worker is falling. But what it reminds us is of the richness of the world's experience. And I think it's a right for us just to be a bit cautious in interpretation. And here, this is the, uh, the ILL and the market rate show, much the same thing. There are other things that we can look at, though. The next slide shows repossession. Another way in which you might think about the seriousness of the recession is how many people's homes have been repossessed. And again, on, on that count, this recession doesn't look anything like as bad as the recession of the early 1990s. Or you might want to see how many companies have been going to liquidation. And, and on that, it does look not as bad as the early 1990s recession. Pretty bad. There's one last thing that I want to say, and that is to come back to how anxious statistics make people feel and how we need to do quite a lot of work to help people with them. We are beset by a media world. We live in a media world. This is a copy of the front page of the Daily Telegraph from. June the 15th, 2010, the Office of Budget Responsibility had recently, I think the previous day, released some new work on the expected cost of public sector pensions, um, which they uh, estimated at £9.6 billion. Pounds. The, the Daily Telegraph thinking, rather in line with what I said earlier on, £9.6 billion pounds isn't a number that people find easy to interpret. I thought, okay, well, let, let's turn that into a number people find easy to interpret. So we'll divide that by the number of households in the UK. So divide it by 26 million. So divide £9.6 by 26 million. 
And they decided that meant the public pensions would cost us £4,000 a year. £9,600 million divided by 26 million. Well, that's 9,600 divided by 26. Or 950 divided by 2.6. So 950 is already less than 4,000. Actually, the answer is, the answer to the sum is a little bit less than 400, not a little bit less than 4,000. This is one of the most heavily staffed, most heavily resourced newspapers in the world Dividing one number by another and getting the answer wrong by a factor of 10. Now, it wasn't just the journalists who did that. The headline writer, the sub-editor and the editor all passed the story, which they made the lead story in one of our quality newspapers, that was completely and unutterably wrong, doing a piece of arithmetic that actually we'd expect somebody at the end of primary school to have a grip on, not to be able to do the answer in their head, but to realise that 9.6 billion divided by 26 million can't be a number with three noughts at the end. That's how much insecure, and I'm not, I'm not just trying to have a go at the Daily Telegraph, because actually all of these papers made this type of mistake, although this was a particularly egregious one. What I am trying to remind us all of is, first of all, the importance of the media. The media is the mirror that we hold up to ourselves to represent the world. And it is an unbelievably distorted mirror. The second point is to make, to make is that because people find this stuff so difficult, we have to do some of that work for them. We have to help them do it. We have to present the marvellous, fabulous, powerful, rich, inescapably important work that you're all doing in ways that are comprehensible. And so I'm delighted to be here, I'm incredibly grateful for the welcome that we have, incredibly respectful of the work that you're all doing. But if I'm a single year, it's that we do that work in ways that make it even easier for people from ministers and permanent secretaries down to understand it. Because until we live in a world where the first thought of the minister and the permanent secretary and the newspaper journalist when this issue comes up is, well, well, what's the data say about this? Until we live in that world, we live in a world where policy is imperfect, where money is wasted and lives that could be made better aren't. Thank you.